Welcome to all of you who are in the room this morning. You're in the community center and welcome to those of you who are watching on channel 81 in the afternoon, Tuesday afternoon. We're grateful for the blessings of God, grateful for you uh, being with us. And so we want to start by simply saying thank you, Lord, for your kindness and your mercy. Thank you that you Amen. are the Lord Jesus Christ, Amen. the Lord of the church. And so as we study Acts and study on into the church history, then we want to see how you're fulfilling your promise. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You will advance your kingdom right into the devil's strongholds and build the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, your own church, your own bride, your own body. And we give you thanksgiving for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Isn't it a wonderful thing? That we belong to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We are his bride. And we have a wedding day coming. Amen. Out there, we don't know when, right? but the promise is that it's coming. And we're going to enjoy that. And the great wedding supper of the Lamb, all that kind of thing will be better than the spaghetti we had. <laughs> anyway, back to where we are here. Oh no, that was the rehearsal dinner. So, <clears throat> that's been almost 40 some odd years ago. More than 40 some odd years ago. I don't remember sure. For sure. And that is something, you know, sometimes things kind of slip your mind. That only happens to me, right? No. <laughs> no. Anyway, we're, we're reviewing. We went through the book of Acts and then we took a break to do some growing up Bible stories, and then we took another break and did a couple of other kinds of things. And so picking up now with the church history part, we're going to go back and review. And so last week we reviewed primarily looking at the doctrines that were held by the early church that get passed on that are so crucial to the ongoing development of the New Testament church. And we want to keep emphasizing this, that always the church has to come back to the New Testament. That's where we have our anchor. Okay? We have the whole of Scripture, Old and New Testament, but it's there in the New Testament that we discover who we are as a church and what we are to believe and how we are to live that out. And so a part of what we will do today is look at the practices that grow out of the early church that we continue to, uh, to rely upon uh, in the church. So I'm at the introduction now of we're at lesson 21, and this is review number two, I call it, because the last week was a review. The doctrines and teachings of the church that we reviewed last week were not separated from the organization and the practices and the spread of the church. However, for purposes of clarity, it was easier to separate them and deal with those and then deal with this. And for clarity then today, we can note that the spread of the church is reflected in the organization of the book of Acts itself. That book is organized. Remember that Luke was an educated man, and he thought in terms of clearly organizing things. And he does so. He does it in the gospel, and here he does it in the book of Acts. And so he divides the book essentially into two sections. There's a continuing flow from chapter 12 to chapter 13. In fact, starting with chapter 10 and chapter 9, actually, we begin to overlap. We go through the book, of the, through uh, chapter 15, and then we're focused pretty well on Peter in the first 12 chapters and on Paul from chapter 13 on, although with that uh, bit of overlap. And so it allows us then to see, Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you in the first chapter, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth, or to the ends of the earth, I think the NIV translates, um, to the ends of the earth. For them, for most of them in Jerusalem, they would have thought of Rome pretty much as the end of the earth because they tended to think in terms of large cities. Many people think that Christianity grew up as a rural religion, as a country religion. It did not. It grew up in the cities. And Paul always went to the big cities. First of all, that's where the synagogues were. <laughs> and secondly, it was the place from which the gospel could spread out because they were crossroads. Philippi, right? Ephesus, and so on. You get all these cities. And from them, then, the gospel could flow out into other areas. 
and those Roman roads were a good way to get uh, to the big cities and then out into the countryside. And so we will see that the spread to the ends of the earth being the city of Rome. Paul knew that there were people in Spain, but there weren't any large cities there. And we don't know for sure, but we think at the end of the book of Acts, he was actually released from prison and went to Spain, came back, and that's when he was again taken into custody and executed somewhere around 65, 66, maybe as late as 67 AD. But in any case, the point here is that we have organization. So what are some of the aspects of organization? I've listed two here, and there's a third one that I should have mentioned and did not, and we'll come to that in just a moment. But what are some of the aspects of organization that become important to the church and then we see continuing on down. We don't have time to read all of the scriptures that I have, but you can look through them and you can see the kinds of things. So first of all, we have the appointing, the selection and election, various words that we can use here, of deacons and elders. Deacons come early on in the sixth chapter of the book of Acts. We discover that the church is growing and the church's ministry, especially to widows, is growing. But a cleavage in Jewish society had occurred about 250 years earlier when the Greeks took over that part of the world. And so many Jews took up Greek culture, Greek language. They spoke Greek as their primary language. And they behaved like Greeks in many ways. When they became, and they were still Jewish, right? As far as their ethnicity, they still went to the temple, all those kinds of things. Uh, but when the church began to grow, they discovered that there were these Greek-speaking Jewish widows in the church. There were many Jews, on the other hand, when that happened, who did not turn to Greek culture and Greek language. They retained Hebrew, now in the dialectical form called Aramaic. And so they were speaking Aramaic. But the Aramaic, or Hebraic, I think is the way the NIV uh, translates, the Hebraic widows were seen as the good ones, and the Greek ones as uh, kind of second-class citizens. After all, these were the people that surrendered to the Greeks, okay? to the worldliness of the Greeks. And so the complaint was that the Grecian widows were not being ministered to in the same way the Hebraic widows were. And they come to the apostles and they complain about this. So the apostles say, well, it's not right for us to quit doing what we're supposed to be doing, praying and preaching and teaching the people of God. So we have an idea. You go select people who can do this job, who can oversee the ministry of compassion to the widows. And we, the apostles, will go on. But when you select them, bring them to us, and we'll pray over them. Now, seven of those, you remember, were chosen, one of whom was Stephen, who will later be stoned. One was Philip, who will later become an evangelist, right? The other five, we, we don't know a whole lot more about. Uh, but in any case, the point here is that the deacons were then chosen. Now, there's a technical argument about whether or not these were deacons in full sense that the church will develop later. I'm not concerned about that at this point. Right? What we have is a ministry that is basically aimed at practical things, but not separated from a spiritual life. After all, Stephen and Philip turn out to be very powerful preachers right? and evangelists in, in Philip's case. So the work of the deacons was practical work, but it wasn't separated from the larger spiritual life of the church. Paul then, or excuse me, Luke will go on then talking about the development of uh, deacons and elders. The first serious mention we get of the presence of elders is about the church in Jerusalem. So it may be the first church that had deacons then, but also is the first church that we know that had elders, specifically na named as elders. At the end of chapter 11, and this is after uh, uh, Paul's uh, early missions work, early uh, ministry. Uh, they take up an offering at the city of Antioch. This is Antioch of Syria. And we'll talk about Syria and Presidian Antioch a little bit later when we look at the map. In any case, this is Antioch of, of Syria. And a prophet from Jerusalem comes down to them 
Jerusalem was considered to be up from anywhere it was, right? Everything else was down. Just as we in North America tend to think in terms of up means north and down means south. Right? In the same way, they thought of up and down as Jerusalem is up and everything is down from there. Right? So you went down to Syria and either Antioch or Presidia, even though they were both north of Jerusalem. And so there in the city of Antioch where a revival had occurred, and Paul and Barnabas were there preaching and teaching along with several others. A prophet comes down from Jerusalem and says there's going to be a famine. And the city of Jerusalem will, and Judea will especially suffer as a consequence of this famine. So he comes down, he prophesies to them. And the people in Antioch say, we ought to do something about this. So they take up an offering. And they give it to Paul and Barnabas and some others of the church in Antioch and say, take it down to Jerusalem. And so Luke says about that, chapter 11, verse uh, 30, that they brought it to the elders of the church in Jerusalem. And so we have mentioned here, both in the church at Jerusalem, those practical leaders that we will later at least call deacons, and also elders. And then as we move on through the book of Acts, there will be a continuing statement about the presence of elders. In chapter 14, we're told specifically that Barnabas and Paul appointed elders in the churches. And these were the ones in the Galatian region, uh, in Lystra and Derby, uh, in Iconium. Uh, they were appointing elders. Now, the appointment of elders by the, uh, the uh, apostles, and in some cases others, Titus, for example, was commissioned by Paul to go to the island of Crete and to appoint elders in the churches there. But that appointment was followed by how do you keep that kind of institutional form, organizational form, going forward when the apostles would end? And the answer is you have to find a system that allows congregations to elect and to appoint their own elders and deacons. So as we go on through the book of Acts then in chapter 20, we see also there a mention of them. So it's Paul who before his death, so we know that we're still somewhere at the end of the book of Acts, right? Chapter 28 or 29, 29 is not there, of course, not written. But nonetheless, what we have is the Apostle Paul writing to both Timothy and Titus. Titus he had sent down to Crete, but Timothy had left in Ephesus to guard the church there because they were having problems and he wanted Timothy to be shepherd over that church. But it meant also being shepherd over the, the uh, growth of uh, deacons in that church. So here's what we have. And Paul writing to Timothy in chapter 4. Am I right in chapter 4? No, it's chapter 3. Yeah, chapter 3 of 1 Timothy. He writes to him, and here, elders are called overseers, or bishops, I think, in the King James Version, is the terms that's used. And also, now, deacons are added to this list. So, we know that in Ephesus, Paul expected them to have both elders and uh, deacons. Here's the trustworthy saying, he says at verse 1 of chapter 3 in 1 Timothy. Whoever aspires to be an overseer or an elder desires a noble task. He doesn't say, don't be so proud and greedy. He says, no, this is a noble task that you're, you're desiring to have. But what you need to understand is there are requirements for this. This isn't going to come because you're popular and can grease hands, right? There's something else involved here. There has to be a spiritual care to grease hands. You don't know the term? No? Sl slip people money. I'm sorry, I grew up in a country town where you greased hands. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, uh, at least that's what some of the adults said. I don't know myself as a kid, but anyway, uh, the point here is that this is not a popularity contest. There has to be a manifest spiritual life that one must pay attention to. So most of us who have been a part of selecting deacons and elders in churches know that one of the first things that happens is you vet people. 
You try to find out, is there anything about their lives that would disqualify them? Right? One of the questions we used to ask them was, what happens if I go to your boss, can, boss and ask him, how does this person do their job? What will I be told? Hopefully the truth. Hopefully the <laughs> truth, yes. <laughs> but all of those are important kinds of things. And so we have here the overseeing. And then he tells them how to do it. You know, you elect them. These are the qualifications, and then you select them and elect them. So that when you get back to that very first election or selection of the, of the deacons, the church chose them and the apostles prayed over them. And so it is. Down even to the present day, most of the churches to which we belong elect deacons and elders, or only deacons, or only elders. It varies in different Protestant churches how that works. <coughs> I don't know where it is, but somewhere it says they needed to be the husband of one wife. I think it says that somewhere. Yes. But I said, it doesn't say if it's one at a time or one ever. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering about that. <laughs> I'm not going to tackle that one. <laughs> oh, I'm not either. I just think it's interesting. <laughs> yes. I did try to hear a man defend one time uh, before a, a, a congregation that it meant one at a time. <laughs> Knowing what else the Paul, Apostle Paul says about being married to one wife, he means one, period, right? <laughs> Unless he's widowed. Yeah. Then that's another question. But otherwise, no. So anyway... What we have here then right, is the way in which we can select deacons and elders. And so the institution itself can continue. And we use it in, in churches right on down to the present time. As I said, some in some cases we have both. Church group I grew up in have both elders and deacons. The one I belong to now is basically just deacons. And <clears throat> your churches may uh, vary. There's another form of organization that also became very important, and this should be B, and what I have as B should really be C uh, in terms of the, the uh, development. So let me put it this way. If you want to pencil this in somewhere, it was a forming of church councils. In chapter 15, in order to deal with a church-wide problem, the question of how do we assimilate non-Jews into the church and what is the nature of the church that Paul will finally spell out in some detail in the book of Ephesians which we will come to in a moment uh, but the church council became an increasingly important way of dealing with church-wide issues and so it is right down to the present time in the assemblies of God which most of us are part of this is our biannual uh, year for general council, right? And what is it, late July, early August, somewhere along there? Uh, pardon? August. August. In August, okay. I knew it was somewhere in that neighborhood. <laughs> and so the need for a, a church-wide council, for people to get together and talk about things that apply to the whole body or the whole denominational structure and group, and the ways then in which it would work. One of the things that my grandfather-in-law, who was one of the early officials of the Assemblies of God, used to say was the marvelous thing about general councils is that they're democratic. Now, he didn't mean that with a capital D. He meant it with a small d. Anyone who, who, who is qualified in terms of the delegation representation can stand up before the microphone and speak his piece, or her piece, as the case may be. So there was a freedom to allow the people of God to speak and to address the issues as they understood them. So church councils, then, are manifestly an important part of church organization in most churches right on down to the present time. The, the, the actual structure and representation, all those kinds of things will vary greatly. But nonetheless, there they are. But Paul also, when he's writing to the Ephesians, in chapter 2, he explains to them the nature of the church as the building of a single body, or as he says it there in, in Ephesians 2, one new man, Jew and Gentile together, making up one new race of people, as it will. Race here used in a metaphor sense, right? uh, rather than ethnic, ethnic sense. It's one new race, that is 
people of God together, whether their ethnicity is this or that or something else. They're brought together as one. But how then does this bear on the institutions of ministry? How do we continue to have, because Paul was aware and others were aware, that the 12 apostles that Jesus chose, and then they, the substitute Matthias after uh, Judas was gone. And Paul was the extraordinary exception to that, making in effect kind of 13. But in any case, that form of the apostolic uh, relationship to the church was going to end. That wasn't going to continue. There are people who claim to be apostles today. I have no problem with that as long as what they're talking about is church planting and that kind of thing. But the moment they want to acclaim, to claim authority over other people, be able to command them and to, I've got a new revelation, that's where it ends. That ended with the apostles. When John died, the last of the living apostles as far as we know, that was it. That closed the door. And so that large church group that claims its apostle still gets revelations from God and can add to them. And we have another book and another book, right? Besides the Bible, there we're, we're, we've gone astray from what the scripture talks about. And so what is it then that Paul does talk about? Right? Let's go to chapter 4 of Ephesians, verse 11. Paul is talking about here when Christ ascended, he took captives and gave gifts to his people. That's in verse, uh, verse 8. He gave gifts to his people. What are those gifts? Verse 11. So Christ gave the apostles and the foundation of the church. He says, I'm the chief cornerstone, but these apostles are the foundation stones for the church. This is the way Paul will put it. But then the ongoing relationship of the ministry, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers. The purpose? To equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So we need one generation after the other. This is not a one-time thing. It happens in this generation, then you just transport the thing, you know, uh, a whole. No, there's a living dynamism in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the need to have a kind of protocol for how to do it and what to do, and the Holy Spirit then guides. That's why those three chapters in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, are so vital to understanding what Paul is talking here about ministers and the way in which they work in relationship to the people of God. And how the Holy Spirit manages that and guides it. And Christ himself being the Lord of the church, as Paul talks about in Ephesians 1, the lordship of the, over the church. So that the Holy Spirit is doing the things the, the, the Son uh, gives him to do. And we see this dynamism in the Godhead itself. But here we have then aspects of organization that become important in the church and continue right on down to the present time. Now, there are many other kinds of organization that develop, many modified forms of, of uh, organization that develop as the church spreads, some of which seem to be reasonable and can work reasonably well, others of which don't seem to be healthy at all. And so we'll look at some of those as we move along, uh, right? Uh, so it's one of those places where we kind of have to give people the freedom to do what they feel like the Holy Spirit is giving them to do as long as it isn't in direct opposition to the scripture. And so we'll see uh, how that works um, as we move along. Well, there are some important practices also. Now we're Roman numeral two, <clears throat> two in the outline. And here again, we have far more scriptures than we can take the time to read. But I thought, well, it gives you something to do on cold night. And we are supposed to get cold again later in the week, right? <laughs> yes. And early next week. We're supposed to be down in the 20s at night. So get your electric blanket and plug it in and wrap it all around you, and then you can read these scriptures. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm obviously being facetious. Right? But <clears throat> the important thing that we have here, there are practices that grow up in the early church 
connected almost always with specific doctrines, so we could go back and look at those. But I wanted to look at them here as practices, as things that we do in response to those doctrines. So that these practices then come into the church and they remain right on down to the present day. First and foremost, water baptism. Now it's true that we have different ways of understanding the nature of baptism, what's called the mode of baptism. I grew up in a church group that was convinced, and I personally, I remain convinced, as many of you are, that full bodily immersion is the true best mode of baptism. Amen. Right? Get them all the way under. Right? Not for long, <laughs> yeah. but full immersion. But others have gone to pouring or sprinkling other kinds of things to represent baptism. Also, another question that will come into the church that we won't deal with until sometime later is what is called pedo baptism, where the word pe or pedo means a child or an infant, infant baptism or child baptism. Uh, baptizing a child before he or she is able to say, yes, Jesus is my Savior, I want to be baptized. Baptize them as infants, but they have no conscious will or knowledge of what is happening to them. That's another question. We'll deal with that question later on. But the form, mode of baptism uh, is present here in, uh, in the book of Acts already. That is full immersion. And we see it here in the first chapter, excuse me, in the second chapter, in the eighth chapter, in the ninth chapter, in the tenth chapter, and in the sixteenth chapter, eighteenth chapter, nineteenth chapter, we see water baptism. Everywhere the church goes, there's full immersion. And it allows the apostle Paul then, when he writes to the Roman church, in the 6th chapter and the 7th chapter, especially in the 6th chapter, to talk about being buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life. Because all the churches were practicing <coughs> that full immersion in baptism. And so when Peter preaches his first sermon and he tells the Jews, you crucified him and God raised him up. And they cry out, what should we do? And Peter says, verse uh, 38 of chapter 2, repent and be baptized. And he continues saying this when he's speaking, calling them. When Philip goes down to Samaria after the persecution, when Stephen is, is killed and the persecution breaks out, Philip goes down to Samaria and he begins preaching and people get saved. And what does he do? He baptizes them. And then the apostles come down and they pray they receive the Holy Spirit. But then Philip is sent down to a desert road to find one man, an Ethiopian official, who is traveling from Jerusalem back down to his job as the director, apparently of finances, director of finances for the Ethiopian queen. And Philip hears him reading, by the way, in the ancient world, people read out loud. <coughs> not quietly, to themselves. So when Bishop Ambrose, the Bishop of Milan, Italy, in the 400s would read, people would see his lips moving, but they didn't see anything out. They didn't hear anything. What an unusual man. He doesn't read out loud. He just reads to himself. But in any case, the point here is, he hears, Philip hears the Ethiopian man reading aloud from the book of Isaiah, and he explains to him about who this is. But the Ethiopian says to him, what hinders me from being baptized? Which means that Philip must have told him that he needed to be water baptized. Here's water, and there's enough to be baptized. <laughs> so they go down, and they're baptized, and the Spirit catches Philip away, and the Ethiopian unit goes on back to Ethiopia. And so we see it repeatedly, water baptism, all through the rest of the book of Acts. Wherever the gospel goes, when it moves into Europe, and we get into chapter 16 of uh, the book of Acts, first of all, there's Lydia of Thyatira, but there in Philippi, and she hears Paul, and the Lord opens her heart, and what happens? Lydia and her whole household 
believe and are baptized. And then Paul and Silas get put in prison. And they're in prison. The Philippian jailer responds to the gospel. And what happens? He takes them out, washes their wounds in the middle of the night. Right? After the earthquake just occurs, he takes them out, washes their wounds, hears the gospel, opens his heart, and he and his household are baptized before breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> and this is an incredible kind of thing that shows you the sense of urgency that they had about water baptism and the importance of water baptism. And so it is. We can see it right on out through. So it's a form of immersion and uh, of uh, pouring and sprinkling and whatnot that we continue to use. I personally still advocate anybody, right, being baptized by full immersion. My father was a pastor in a small town in Indiana. Uh, this is a separate one from where I remarked that they grease the palms. This was a separate <laughs> little town, right? And one night, the, the, one of the grocers in town called and said, you know, Brother Ringer, my wife wants to talk to you. They were Methodists, this couple. I shouldn't have said that out loud, should I? <laughs> she had been sprinkled. As a youth, she knew what she was doing. But she had this longing in her heart to be fully immersed. She was on her deathbed. So what did they do? They filled the bathtub, of, bathtub up with water. And her husband and dad put her in the bathtub and baptized her. Full immersion in the bathtub. Right? And she was so relieved. She died about two days later. Right? It was her heart's desire. There was something God had put in her that wanted that. And so it is right on down to the present day. The feeling and the need. But also a second thing. That practice, uh, a practice that becomes crucial, is the assembling of the people together. In fact, the word from which we get church, ecclesia, was an assembling, a calling out. The Greeks used it, first of all, a calling out of citizens from other people in the city to a gathering where the citizens would make decisions about the city government. Right? The number of people in a town that were citizens was usually quite small by comparison to the total population. You might have 100,000 people in a city, but only 10,000 or less of them would actually be citizens. And only citizens were called out to the meeting to make decisions, the ecclesia, the calling out. And so it is that people were called out from the world, whether they were Jews or Gentiles, called out into the body of Christ, into the ecclesia. But that ecclesia needed regularly to meet together, as many as were possible to get in wherever it was they could assemble. And so we see, first of all, in Acts chapter 2, they met in one of the temple courtyards where they could all get together, and then they grew to 5,000. And so they were meeting in different places. Their homes were in particular places where they would meet, but they all considered themselves a part of one body. And then we begin to see that their purposes for their meeting, this first group of scriptures here, from the second chapter and then from the 20th chapter, was for worship and for instruction and for communion. So when Paul left the Asian continent to go to the European continent, the seaport from which he left was Troas. And a church had started there. So when he comes back, going back to Jerusalem, he lands at Troas. Right? And in chapter 20, of verse 7, on the first day of the week, we met together to break bread, to have communion. And so here now, the conviction about meeting together, assembling together, specifically to have communion. We see functioning here in this church in Troas. And as we go on, we discover there are other reasons to assemble. In chapter 5, where they're meeting one of the, the uh, porticos in the temple, porch of, of the temple, they meet apparently for teaching. We're not told specifically. There were lots of miracles and things that were happening there, but apparently that was for teaching. We go on from this in chapter 6. That's where they select the deacons, right, in chapter 6. 
But in chapter 15, at the church council, when they meet together, they talk about how to resolve this problem of having Gentiles in the church. What do we, what do, we do with this? They make the decision. Everybody gets their say. The, the discussion goes on and on and on and on. And finally, it is Peter who stands up and kind of brings some resolution to it. And then James, this is the half-brother of Jesus, this James. The other James have already been executed. James, the first apostle, right? And this James is not an apostle, but he does become the key leader in the church at Jerusalem. Jesus is half-brother. He is the one who writes the book of James. And James stands up. He says, I think we've come to a consensus here. It's not the word he uses, it's the word I'm using. We've come to a consensus here. And here's what we should do. We will tell them this. And he outlines it. And then they write a letter outlining what James said. And in that letter, James writes and he says, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. And the assembling together now in what is a church council, which I'd already mentioned as an organizational pattern, nonetheless becomes important. And so we meet together not only to worship, not only to have communion, but sometimes because there are decisions that need to be made. Right? And so the assembling together to make decisions. The writer of the book of Hebrews also touches on this. The church has expanded outward. Now there are Jews scattered all over the Roman world, and some of them are getting queasy. Things are getting pressured, and so they're thinking about turning back, not serving the Lord anymore. The writer of the book of Hebrews writes to encourage them to stay steadfast and stable, right? Because if you don't, and you turn away from the Lord, what do you have? You no longer have your salvation. You have nothing left. And so it's better to tough it out, as it will, to live through it. But he says, you know what? You need each other. And so in chapter 10 of Hebrews, right, he says to them, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as some are doing. Why? He says in the verse just before that, and then finishes it up, to encourage one another, to build each other up. And isn't it true? Right? To, to meet with other believers, even if it's only one other person you can sit down and, pr and pray with. There's such an encouragement, such an uplifting of our spirits. And so it is. Right? We continue to meet together, to encourage and build up. The pandemic has done terrible things to us uh, in many ways in our meeting together. But still, thankfully, we're coming back together increasingly. I think you know, what will happen in the future, we don't know. But we meet together. And sometimes it's necessary that what we have to do to meet together is to break up in smaller groups. One of the Chinese churches in one city that I couldn't name but I won't, had about 100 people and the security services of the Chinese government began to put pressure on them. So what did they do? They broke up into three different units of meeting in houses. So 30 or 32 in one place and 31 or 34 in another place. Yeah. So they meet that way. They're flying under the radar, but they still think of themselves as one body. Even though they're meeting in these different places for different reasons. So, to need, the need to edify and encourage, but also for, and this is point C here under Roman numeral 2, corporate prayer. Yeah. All right. To pray together. We see it in the book of Acts, right? in uh, different places. In chapter 4, we see them in corporate prayer. Chapter 12, we see them in corporate prayer. Right? The one in chapter 12 is a good one. This is the one where they're praying for Peter. Peter's in prison, and Herod plans to kill him. <laughs> but they pray for him. And they pray, the church prays earnestly for him. And you remember the story. <laughs> he comes to the door, knocks on the door, and they think that it's his ghost. <laughs> his angel and so they don't want to let him in but the point here is that the church would meet together for corporate prayer and seek the Lord for specific things, for specific goals and so it's still important in corporate prayer that we lift each other up and so we have prayer requests and we lift each other up and most of us I suspect when we go home we remember those requests 
and we pray for them. So that corporate prayer is a way of collectively praying and encouraging us to go on praying. And the importance then of corporate prayer. Some groups have written prayers that corporately they can pray. I don't have a problem with that myself. I used to before I learned that the church is much bigger than the little group that I belong to. <laughs> I still love that group, right? Uh, but the point here is that we pray together and we unite around it. And I love the corporate prayer. When everybody's praying, we're listening to one person lead the prayer, but we're all praying and lifting up and joining in uh, that prayer, the importance of corporate prayer. And Paul tells Timothy, remember, he had sent this Timothy, this is the same one that we were talking about earlier, to Ephesus. He said, I want you to teach them how to pray together. I want them to lift up holy hands in prayer, not fighting and quarreling, but rather in unity, lifting up their hands in corporate prayer. Why, he said, because that way, collectively, you can pray for your leaders. Why? Because I want all people to be saved. So I want them to live in a world that is open to the gospel. So if you pray for your leaders, maybe they'll make the right decisions and say, those people are not hurting us. In fact, they're probably good for us. Let's let them worship together. They're doing works of compassion. Let's let them do those works of compassion. And so the importance of praying for our leaders, and we continue to do that. It doesn't matter whether we believe in their politics or not. I'm sure Paul wasn't saying, hey, if I had to vote, I'd vote for Nero. <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> but the point here is the importance of praying for leaders. And Kathy and I oftentimes, when we pray for missionaries on the, the monthly you know, birthday uh, prayer list that we send out, we often pray for the leaders of the countries where those missionaries are working. Right? so that there can be freedom for the believers in those nations. And the church can grow and spread. And people aren't afraid, if I become a Christian, the government will do this to me. Or if I become a Christian, the cultural leaders will do this to me. And so we pray for religious leaders and cultural leaders and all that kind of thing. And the importance of corporate prayer. But the church also, and we were watching this as we were going through the book of Acts, letter D, Generosity. The first thing that happened when the Holy Spirit, Spirit fell on the church uh, in uh, the second chapter of the book of Acts, the first thing that happened after they were organized is that they became generous. And it will continue right on through the book of Acts. The generosity. And it expands outward, not just to generosity, but to all forms of compassion. Compassion ministries. When the Assemblies of God was first formed, there was a hesitancy to organize compassion ministries. People were compassionate, congregations were compassionate, but there was a hesitation to form compassion ministries in a larger sense. Right? Because it's so easy for compassion ministries to degenerate into humanitarian issues without the gospel. It can happen, it does happen to some groups. But the important part is the compassion ministry that is connected to verbal witness. So the ongoing, why am I doing this? I'm doing it in the name of Jesus that you might know his love and his compassion and the importance of those compassion ministries. And all of us are familiar with them right on down to the present day. And all of us encourage them in different kinds of, of ways and support them different kind of ways, right? I love it when the red kettle comes out. I always earmark, you know, hey, there's some, there's some dollars here that can go in a red kettle, wherever it may be around the city, wherever I am, in the grocery store, wherever else I may be. Right? Many of you know what I mean by the little red kettles, right? That uh, kind of thing. Generosity and compassion then becomes a part of the church life. So where did the first genuine ongoing hospital chains come from? You don't have to go very far to any city in America. And you will see over the top of the hospital, St. Elizabeth's, St. John's, St. Francis, on and on. Out of the church in the larger mode. And on and on and on we could go. The establishing 
of that great hospital in Calcutta. Right? By the man whose name I can't remember. <laughs> Mark Bentain. Mark, Bentain. Mark Bentain, right, wouldn't come to me at all. That, that's what happens when you get past 60. <laughs> His wife Don't just tell died. Me that. <laughs> Don't tell you that. His wife Hilda just died. His wife Hilda. Hilda, yes. Just she just died. died. Oh, really? Yeah. When? I don't know. A year, a year and a half ago. Oh, okay. Yeah. My wife probably knew that, but I, I don't recall knowing it myself. But in any case, the point here is compassion ministry, right? That's where we were. But always, of course, and Mark Buntain is a, is a fantastic example of this, always there was a public pre preaching. And it was directly related to missions, <coughs> to the outreach of missions. When the Holy Spirit said to the church in Antioch, separate unto me Paul and Barnabas, I have a work for them to do. They were going to do public preaching, but it was missions. It was the sending out of missionaries. That public preaching may have been in the form of reaching all the people in the marketplace. It may have been reaching one person. as when Philip went down to the, the, uh, the road in Gaza. But the point here is public preaching. And again, I've identified a number of places. Peter's preaching, obviously, there in the second chapter of Acts. Some of these are places where they went into the synagogues. Because the synagogues were the place not only where the Jews themselves came, but also where Greek God-fearers came. The Greeks who had come to believe that the God of Israel was the true living God. And so they would come in. And so to come into the synagogue was an opportunity to do public preaching. But then Paul, of course, will eventually find that the marketplace is a marvelous place. And so he goes uh, to public preaching. In the 17th chapter of the book of Acts, for example, he goes into the marketplace there and begins preaching to the Greeks. Ah, I see by all of your things here, you're a very superstitious people. You're very God-minded God's plural minded, right? That kind of thing. But we have the public preaching and missions, and you can see these scriptures as we uh, go through. Well, the church moves out. And so that's why we have the map, right? And so I'm going to hold my outline here so I can kind of track us out here. Jesus said, from Jerusalem to, to Judea to Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth. So we start down here in Jerusalem. And this purple on the map, by the way, is the expansion of Christianity. And you can see the on the outline, I've used these scriptures. So first of all, we have Jerusalem, and then Judea here, and Samaria up here toward Damascus. Right? Not Syria, not that far north, but up toward uh, Ptolemaeus right up here. Right? We have those, uh, those cities. The church moves out. So in chapter 5 and chapter 8, chapter 9, we see the church spreading out in those areas and coming to have joy uh, in the Lord. And then Peter goes down, first of all, to Joppa, and then he's called up to Caesarea, the city up here, okay, to Caesarea. Why? Because there's a man there who is a, a God-fearer, and the Lord says to him, I want you to go. Don't ask me any questions. I don't call unclean what I call clean. Go up there and talk to this man, Cornelius, and his family. And the Lord pours out upon the, the Holy Spirit. But when the persecution broke out in Jerusalem, after the stoning of Stephen, the disciples began spreading out. They went all the way down here, all the way, in fact, over to Cyrene. They went here to Alexandria and Egypt. They went up in various places, all the way up to the island of Cyprus. And then some of them went over to Syrian Antioch. Here's Syria, right? And so Syrian Antioch. And there they begin preaching the gospel to Gentiles, not in the synagogues, but out on the streets, to the neighbors. They begin talking to them. And the church spreads to Antioch, Syria. And that church, along with the Jerusalem church and the Alexandrian church, will become three major sources of the stream of Christianity for the first roughly 400 years, right? Spreading out in different directions from those churches and will become uh, key places. So we see from there <clears> that Paul's missionary journey takes them on up, and they end up here at another Antioch. If I can find it, get back away from it. Right? Here it is, the other Antioch. And this is 
up in uh, Pisidia, right? And they go up to that church in Antioch and, and the church that grows there. You can see that in the 13th chapter, right? If we go to the 14th chapter, there's trouble in Antioch. And so they'll go down to Lystra and to Derbe and to Iconium. And you see, again, the spreading of the church that's, that we have going uh, from this and the moving of the church outward, right? And then they want to go on, he and Silas wanted to go on up into this area of Asia, uh, our, the continent of Asia, but not the province of Asia, not the Roman province of Asia. They wanted to go up there, and the Holy Spirit said, no. No, can't go there, can't go there. I've got something else for you. So go down here to Troy, or the word we have, Troas, right? And go over here. He has a dream. And in the dream, he has a vision. And says, come over here to Macedonia and help us, right? And so across they go, and they end up here at Philippi, right? Then they go down to Thessalonica, and there a riot starts, and so they get Paul out. He goes down to Berea, and then he goes down to Athens. Right? And so you see the spread of the church going down here now on the European continent, as distinct from the Asian continent. Luke does not tell us about the spread of the church down here in Egypt, right? But it does, and it spreads and goes further and further down into Egypt. But in Athens, something very important happens. Paul is talking to the, the Greeks there in the city, and he says to them, you know what? The Lord God made all human beings from one person. We all come from him. All the races of people and all the nations are where they are because God put them there and in their timing. But it's an interesting kind of thing that God chooses that the gospel should go here rather than there at the hands of Paul and Silas. He is sovereign over the nations, including when the gospel goes to them. Now, that doesn't mean that we always get it right. As human missionaries, we sometimes ought to go when we don't go. Right? But nonetheless, the point here is that God is sovereign over the nations. And so Jesus says, I'm going to build my church. I'm going to build it in my time and in my way. So come join me and do it my way and my place, my time, and the way in which he does it. So we see this. Then when we get to chapter 18, Paul has come all the way down to Athens and crosses over here to Corinth. He spends about two and a half years or so in Corinth, building the church in Corinth. At first, it's hard going there. It was a very perverse and, and obscene city. And so he was having all kinds of trouble. But the Lord said to him, Paul, I've got a lot of people in this city, so don't get bent out of shape. Just stay here and work. And so he does. He then goes and builds the church in Ephesus, and we see the church of Troas, and finally, to the end of the earth, Rome. Right? Chapter 28 of the book of Acts, the church is at Rome. So we see this Mediterranean world covered with the church, and from there, it just goes everywhere, right on down to the islands of the sea, and the smallest places in the world, the church. Well, how that happens is the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say, and that's where we will pick up, Lord willing, next week. And I've run us over time this morning. But uh, hopefully I haven't run, run the uh, recorded part of it over so it fits in time space that we have. So, Father, thank you for the living church, which is none other than your own life through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit working in us as individual people. And down through the ages, you've manifested your glory, granted that through us today, you may manifest your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you.